Good evening, everyone. It's my true honor and pleasure to invite you to the Mark Twain House this evening. Um, it's such a beautiful venue, and we're delighted to be here. Um, I'd like to thank Simsbury Public Television for taping this event. And um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Susan Messino. I'm a professor of applied science in, uh, at Trinity College, and I'm a joint appointment in neuroscience and psychology. So I run a biomedical research lab. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not an environmental science scientist, but I've uh, spent a number of years being very, very interested in those issues, um, particularly as they relate to forests. So um, what I did bring tonight are some materials on a side table, which include a policy forum tomorrow night at Trinity College at 7.30 in McCook Auditorium. Um, one of the IPCC co-authors and two other top policy and science people will be um, at Trinity for a forum on forests, energy, and climate. Um, so there are a number of handouts on that table that you might be interested in, including a paper that I just um, published as an interdisciplinary project on the concept of <coughs> proforestation. So proforestation would be allowing our existing suitable forests to grow to reach their full potential and ecological and structural integrity and protect all of the biodiversity that evolved here on Earth, which is a main focus of my, basically, all my time and effort right now is protecting the natural world. Um, before I have the real honor of in, um, introducing tonight's um, guest and speaker, I'd like to um, invite Ben Martin from 350CT up to the stage to make a couple of announcements. <coughs> Um, I don't even know if I need this microphone. I can probably project to this room. But um, I'm not a climate scientist either. I'm by trade a computer scientist. But my volunteer passion is uh, 350 Connecticut, which is a group that has been working towards uh, getting Connecticut off fossil fuels and for climate justice for 10 years or more. And um, I just, just to introduce us, we, we work on stopping the expansion of natural gas in Connecticut, which has been a huge problem over the last five years and getting more renewable energy as well as um, expanded mass transit and uh, basically trying to get Connecticut to do its job in addressing climate change and climate emergency that we currently have. Um, our last event uh, in, in coalition with a bunch of other groups in the Connecticut Climate Crisis Mobilization group was the September 20th climate strike in Hartford at the Capitol and um, I think it was fairly successful. We got about 1,500 people there and um, to tell the government that we need to take action on climate change because it is definitely an emergency and something that needs to be addressed now and heavily addressed for the next uh, 10 or 11 years so that we can get on the right track. Um, so. We're happy to sponsor this event, which is definitely in our real house of doing that. Um, if you're interested in us, we will have a table with paper that's out there on current efforts that we're doing to stop uh, the natural gas uh, fired plant of Killing Link in Killingly, Connecticut, as well as uh, getting the governor to take better action on his executive order on climate change. And if you'd like to help us or know more about us, we're having a meeting on November 10th from 4 to 6. Um, it will be announced on our website, 350connecticut.org. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to come to talk to us after the talk. And I hope you enjoy the talk tonight, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And just to adjust that message on no fossil fuels, what we really need is carbon-free energy. And uh, Governor Lamont does have that in his plan. Because if you just say no fossil fuels, that allows people to think that something like burning wood is a good idea for renewable energy. And currently, in Connecticut's energy portfolio, burning wood and burning trash are both subsidized as renewable energy. And burning wood is subsidized at the same level as wind and solar. So we need to really think about the natural world as something to protect. And um, we need, especially our public forests, for climate and biodiversity and our own spiritual and physical health. So um, that's my um, passion. 
And tonight, I know someone who is really interested in helping people to connect to their communities and um, figure out how we're going to move forward is award-winning journalist and author Dar Jamail. So his recent book, The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption, um, is really just some an important work to bring to the public stories from the top scientists from around the globe. And it's really been eye-opening for me, even as a scientist, to come to know Dar's work, see his lectures on the inter internet, and really, for me personally, find a new level of trying to find my path and connect to the future and to my community. So um, please join me in welcoming Dar Jamail. Thanks very much, Susan. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, I like to start all my lectures with acknowledging that we are on indigenous land and thank the local people that were stewards of this land for thousands of years for that stewardship. Um, and uh, Susan, you've done a, a lot of work bringing me out here and organ doing a lot of organizing, not just for tonight, so thank you so much. And I want to thank my friend Terry Delahunty, wherever you are out there, there you are right there, for r picking me up and running me around and mostly being my friend. Um, so, uh, if you're not familiar with my work, uh, this book and my writing on the climate crisis, uh, uh, this is not going to be a light evening. Um, I, I cut my teeth as a journalist going into Iraq to report on what was really happening. Um, and it was, at uh, it, it first, uh, people couldn't believe what was happening because it was held up against the corporate media reporting. And, uh, which was, of course, whitewashing the, the war and occupation. And it wasn't until years later that my reporting bore itself out. And um, I've been having a really similar experience now with the climate crisis, even though there's people, I've been reporting on it for about nine years, and there's people that have been writing about it and talking about it and writing books about it for far, far longer than I have. But um, it's been pretty challenging to find people that uh, even though we're looking at a lot of the same scientific studies that are coming out and watching the observational evidence right in front of our faces, that we'll really talk honestly about how far along we really are. And so that was my goal in this book, is I, I went to several hot spots around the planet, like the Amazon and the Great Barrier Reef and South Florida for sea level rise and Glacier National Park for glaciers and uh, other places like this and did a chapter on each of these topics to really try to bring to people that wouldn't normally be able to go to these places what was really happening and then going out into the field with scientists who were experts on those uh, specific areas, people who had long-term intimate relationships with these places and uh, really present that in a book in total uh, and then looking at the big picture, not just one facet of it, but all of it together and that's where it gets pretty overwhelming. Um, I, um, um, I, I want to, you know, so I think the context that I give this information to you kind of in before I, the, to preface it before I get into, I'm going to take you to two different places in the book and then give you a, a kind of a, a big, bigger macro picture of, of where we are thus far yeah. in the crisis. Um, but before I, w I do that, I, I just want to, um, you know, just some anecdotal stuff. I, I mean, two days ago I was in San Francisco visiting a friend, and the smoke there from the fires in Sonoma County, I mean, I was literally Saturday at noon uh, on the tarmac getting ready to take off to go back to Seattle. And you, I don't know if you're familiar with the Bay Area, but I couldn't see the mountains in East Bay from the smoke. And it's way worse now than it, than it was Saturday. And the fires are way worse. And I don't know if you've seen the reports or looked at the pictures, but, you know, California is just burning right now. You know, and P.S., it's almost November. Um, and this is the norm. You know, this is the norm. And some people are there concerned that the way things are going and more, more high winds coming in. I mean, it's, this is it. So... Um, with that kind of thing happening, and that's just one tiny example. This, this, you know, just look around the globe, 
at things happening in front of our face. Look at what happened in Greenland last summer or the Arctic and the permafrost thawing literally in real time. Um, um, my primary message tonight, I think, if, if you take anything away, is that there's no more future tense about the crisis, that it's upon us now. And yes, things are going to get far more intense in the future, but um, we're, we're in it now. So if you're in the Bay Area, or especially if you're in Sonoma County right now, there's absolutely no more future tense about this. Like, you, you are in it. If you've had to evacuate your house and you're, you're driving around, even I just saw a little snippet, even LeBron James, the famous basketball player with the Los Angeles Lakers, is driving around and had yet to be able to find a room for his, his family. You know, I mean, like, that's what's happening down there right now in real time. So um, I, I, I use a, one of the analogies I use. So I used to work up in Alaska and had a lot of different jobs. But what I was doing right before I became a, a, a full-time journalist was I was a mountain guide up on Denali. And so the analogy that I like to use for having done nine years of research and really connected all these dots of how far along we are and really kind of gone through my own process of moving through the five stages of grief around it from the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross model is, is I, I had this idea of an analogy that I like to use. And it would be uh, if I was guiding a group on Denali and we're up at high camp at 17,000 feet. And every evening when you're on Denali, the Park Service gives out a weather report. Uh, and uh, it, it'd be if I got a weather report that from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, that said, okay, we've never seen anything like this. We have the biggest storm ever coming your way fast. You can't come down. You just need to hunker in the best you can. It looks really, really bleak, but at least you have this much notice that this thing is upon us and you have at least you know, some hours to prepare. And then so I, I got off that call and then there I am with say nine people that I'm responsible for and two other guides. Um, would I not tell them that, right? Of course I would tell them. I would tell them the specifics. I would tell them everything that I know and then say, okay, so like, you know, okay, these, this, the, you two or three people, you're going to get together our food and fuel and figure out what we have. And then you people over here, we're going to double pole the tents and reinforce the snow walls and do everything we can and, and hunker down and get as ready as we can for this. And then uh, we're going to make the most of it and we're going to go through it together. And that's the way I view this situation now. And that's the way I view my responsibility is, even though I'm not actually working as a journalist anymore, I just hung that up um, literally a couple of weeks ago. But since I'm still talking about this book, I feel like it's my moral obligation to be just simply share with you what I know. And so that's all I'm doing. So all the information that I'll share with you tonight is from peer-reviewed scientific studies or the scientists that I spoke with directly in the field in the places that I will talk to you about tonight. So the first place that um, I want to talk with you about uh, will be, uh, I'll take you to South Florida and talk about sea level rise. Uh, Susan thought it would be a good thing for me to discuss here tonight. Um, so, South Florida, um, and this is being taped for TV, so I'll, I'll not cuss, but um, <laughs> the, best, the best way I can describe working on the chapter on sea level rise in South Florida, and bear in mind when I was there, Governor Rick Scott was still governor, who's now senator, who m most of you in this audience are probably aware, he was the one who forbade state employees from using the words climate change or global warming uh, publicly or in writing. A um, little bit of denialism going on there. So uh, that was the scene. And then you go to Florida, and uh, to Miami, and then more specifically Miami Beach, and it's kind of envision, it, for, for those who haven't been there, envision Las Vegas at like one foot sea level. Um, it's insane the amount of money, the construction, the, the, um, the real estate bubble. It's pretty crazy what's going on. And then you're at Miami Beach and you look back at Miami 
and it, about a fifth of the buildings have cranes on them. I mean, it's just exploding and property values and all of this. So that's the setting. And then I go there and talk with two of the leading climate, uh, I'm sorry, the leading sea level rise experts on the planet. And so the first person I go and speak with is Dr. Ben Kurtman. He's an IPCC author, a sea level rise expert, and he was talking to me about the worst case IPCC predictions for sea level rise by 2100, which at the time was one meter of sea level rise. Um, but then he went on and literally the week I was talking with him, he said, but NOAA just updated their worst case projections for sea level rise to 8.5 feet uh, by 2100. Since then, within the last year, there's been at least one other very mainstream scientific outlet that also updated their worst case sea level projections from between two and three meters by 2100. Um, it's just like everything else, there's this constant trend of acceleration. I think in the 90s, uh, sea level rise uh, per year was 3.4 millimeters. Now it's about 4.5. And it's, again, you look at the long range uh, timeline of it and everything's kind of doing the Michael Mann hockey stick graph going up. So Ben Kurtman was pretty staid. He explained why uh, that part of Florida specifically was a bullseye for sea level rise. It's, it, it, it doesn't rise the same level in all the coastlines on the planet equally at once. Uh, there's several factors. Um, when you warm up water, it expands. So warming oceans, this is, we've had five years record warming in the oceans now and counting. So that's a factor winds, currents, and then of course adding, you know, melting Greenland and Antarctica and adding that in. So those are the four main factors. And when you factor all those in and the winds and the currents and, and, and how they are oriented right off the coast of South Florida, Miami Beach is a bullseye. So this is an area like several others around the globe that that's where we're going to see it um, fast and furious and that's what's happening. So I was there, and uh, after meeting with Ben Kurtman, I went out with then city engineer in Miami Beach, a guy named, uh, um, oh, what was his name, Bruce Mallory. He's no longer there, but he was tasked with rising, uh, engineering up uh, different parts of roads in Miami Beach, raising them three feet to buy them time for what was coming. And he knew that that was basically preparation for the IPCC's mid-range projections. Uh, and he just wouldn't talk about the, the worst case projections. But he said, but here's what we're doing. But even that was already running into problems. So he shared one story where one area they had risen the street, raised the seats three streets three feet. And there was a big high rise, uh, multi-million dollar fancy condo complex. Um, high tide coupled with a big rain event, that area flooded, that building flooded, the first floor did. And then so the folks went to try to get their insurance money for it. And the insurance company said, sorry, that's now a basement. We don't have to insure you. So unforeseen consequences, these things are kind of starting to play themselves out there too. Uh, um, while again, at the time you had this governor who wouldn't allow people to say the words climate change and global warming. And then they had a thing where, so since they couldn't use those words, they called it sunny day flooding. <laughs> when it was high, day, high tides, where literally there were places already in Miami and Miami Beach where if it was a particularly high tide, even though when I was there they were in drought, there's fish swimming across the road. But that's sunny day flooding. So all that kind of worked on your mind, and you know, so I called it a bit of a, a mind F. Um, when I was there, and I wasn't the only one to experience that. Um, so uh, then after going around with Bruce Mallory and talking with him, and then seeing what was going on in Miami Beach myself, I met with a guy named Dr. Harold Wanless, uh, professor and chair of the University of Miami Department of Geological Science. He's got a BA in geology from Princeton, an MS in marine geology from University of Miami, and a PhD in earth and planetary sciences from Johns Hopkins. Um, so he's extremely well positioned to provide a very holistic view of, of the climate crisis. And so 
um, I met with him, and he's one of these guys where it's it's often challenging to find a scientist that will just be frank. You know, I mean, they'll you know, and I understand for academic reasons and funding reasons that they will very they'll only talk about studies and just be very middle of the road and kind of staid about things. But Weinless is one of these guys that just didn't give an F. Uh, he just, he's tenured, he's an older guy, he's like, look, I'm just telling it like it is. And uh, I go into his office and that's, I start talking to him um, about having met with Ben Kurtman, who he is friends with, and Bruce Mallory. And I'd like to just um, read a short bit from that. We sat down and, you know, normally you kind of sit down with a scientist, especially someone as renowned as he. and. Okay, let's just break the ice and have a little chit chat. And he just jumps right into it. Um, he says, quote, we've screwed ourselves. We kicked the bucket. We've gone off the cliff. 93.4% of the global warming heat we've produced is in the oceans. And half of that went in since just 1997. And this is him talking. That is unbelievable. If we'd only gotten hold of this when we knew about it in the 80s, we'd have less than half the problem we have now. Wanless, who's been watching things go from bad to worse for so long, is taken aback by the business-as-usual mindset of the general public. We have to stop doing this, he continues. With population increasing, with industrialization ongoing, and with the sad exuberance about opening the Arctic as an opportunity to get more oil and gas, shouldn't we be thinking, oh my God, what have we done? And so we went on to talk at length. Uh, he's been to Greenland and he's written extensively about what's happening on the Western Antarctic ice sheet and uh, talked about, you know, there was a, a one study that had come out not long before I met with them, uh, co-authored by James Hansen, based on paleoclimate records, said we could even see 10 feet of sea level rise by uh, 2050, 20, uh, which seems... Um, pretty science fiction, but uh, he was even talking about that study. Um, and he talked a lot about Turkey Point nuclear power plant, which I don't know if folks, I, I didn't know about it until I went there. I'd never spent any time in Miami or Miami Beach, but just south of, of Miami, uh, there's on a barrier island, there's the Turkey Point nuclear power plant at six feet sea, uh, elevation. And instead of like you know, knowing what's happening, a logical same response might be, maybe we should decommission that. It takes at least 10 to 12 years, I think, conservatively to decommission a nuclear power plant. Maybe that would be the prudent thing to do, especially since it's right on top of this thin lens of fresh water that the entire region relies upon for their drinking water. Maybe we should deal with that. Instead, they actually are now building another reactor at it. So again, there's that mind F of being, being down there working on this topic. And then things got even more interested, in, interesting where um, he, I'll just read it to you. So right before I was going to leave uh, um, his office, we had a, a conversation and I'll just share that to close this out. I know that he and Kurtman are friends and have worked together. Wallace has nothing but positive things to say about Kurtman and his work, but as our time together came to an end, he offers his one critique. <coughs> he says we have to fix this, Wallace says. I tell him we can't undo this. How are you going to cool down the ocean? We're already there. As if to underscore everything that he has shared with me, Wallace leaves me with one more piece of data. In the past, atmospheric CO2 varied from roughly 180 to 280 parts per million as the Earth shifted from glacial to interglacial periods. This 100 ppm fluctuation was linked with about a 100 foot change in sea level. Quote, every 100 ppm CO2 increase in the atmosphere gives us 100 feet of sea level rise, he says. This happened when we went in and out of the ice age. I recall that since the Industrial Revolution began, atmospheric CO2 has increased from 280 to 410 ppm. It's now 415. That is 130 ppm in just the last 200 years, I say to him. That is 130 feet of sea level rise that's already baked into Earth's climate system. He looks at me and nods grimly. So with that, that means uh, one study 
I came across recently showed that by 2100, that would equate to 13 million refugees just from sea level rise. Uh, globally, that converts to 2 billion refugees by 2100 just from sea level rise. Um, now I want to move on to the Amazon. Um, I think it's also a good topic to bring up given what happened this summer. Uh, it's hard not to be emotional about this, having been there, and I got to go with Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, known as the godfather of biodiversity. He's been studying it longer than I've been alive. And um, how passionate and, and humble he is about the Amazon and his studies there. Um, this is a guy, I mean, if you look at his resume, it's gonna take you a while to read it, but in short, he's, uh, he's been, He's an amazing scientist. He's been on um, several White House Science Councils. He was head of the World uh, Wildlife Fund for 14 years in the U.S. Um, and has literally devoted his entire life to studying and try to conserve the Amazon. And so uh, a little bit about the Amazon. Uh, again, I know with this crew, a, a lot of this is probably known, but I like to go over it just to remember how amazing uh, these places are uh, on our planet. Um, the Amazon is two-thirds the size of the contiguous United States. It's the largest rainforest in the world. It generates half of its own rainfall and contains one-fifth of the rivers on the entire planet. The Amazon River alone has 1,100 tributaries. Excuse me, 17 of them are longer than 1,000 miles. There's thousands of species of trees, 2.5 million species of insects, thousands of species of birds, and 3,000 species of fish in the Rio Negro alone. Uh, I interviewed one scientist who was part of an expedition of mostly Brazilian scientists that were helicopter dropped into uh, a remote part of the Amazon and where they spent, there were about, I think, 30 of them, and they spent 25 days. And that one expedition alone netted 80 new species of fish, reptiles, birds, etc. <laughs> Um, that aside, in general, there's an average of uh, one species, I think it's, uh, no, I think it's like, um, it's one and a half species every two days is I think the general average are still being discovered there. Gives you an idea of how rich uh, the biodiversity is there. And when I asked Dr. Lovejoy, the guy who's been studying it since 1965, and you know, he, he founded Camp 41, which is where we went, and several of these other study camps. And Camp 41 alone has netted seven, over 700 peer-reviewed scientific studies. And I, at one point I just said, you, we know so much about the Amazon. He says, we don't know anything, <laughs> right? We don't know anything, you know? He's like, we barely scratched the surface. So when I, uh, we, we went in, we flew into Manaus and then took Jeeps and deep into the rainforest to Camp 41 on these very slick clay dirt roads with very good drivers uh, and very bumpy, long, hot Jeep rides. And then we get into Camp 41 and Dr. Lovejoy runs down this little trail and, uh, and then we each get our backpacks and kind of walk down this little trail. There was about a dozen or 15 of us uh, from different places around the globe. And this is a guy, he was world-renowned biodiversity expert. And he ran down there just so he could stand right at the entrance of Camp 41, just like quarter mile down this trail, and just like shake each of our hands and thank us for coming to see the rainforest. Because he knew how important it was to advocate for it and get, you know, Get, get word out about the Amazon and how amazing it is and the importance of protecting it. And then Camp 41 was a clearing in the jungle, maybe the size of this auditorium, so not, not very big. Um, and you walk in and over here there's a metal roof with um, just hammocks hanging with mosquito netting. Uh, there's no walls anywhere. Oh, back over there, there's picnic tables in the kitchen, and then over here's hammocks for the scientists, and that's it. And um, it was an amazing experience. Uh, how many people here have been to the Amazon? Okay, a few. So you'll you'll know. Like, I mean, I wasn't there that many days, but immediately 
the best way I can describe it is like the forest starts kind of like growing up into you and like pulling you into it. So even like the first night, my dreams were very vivid. Some of them like really unsettling, some of them really amazing. And then you wake up very, very early with howler monkeys, you know, the, the, their roars going through camp. And it's just a really, really incredible experience. And you could, I could literally feel it changing. You like, it just pulls you into it. You know, it's a really incredible experience. Just there's so much life and so much biodiversity. It has a very, very like, tangible, visceral effect on you. Yeah, and you're nodding because you you under you've been there. <laughs> yeah, it's it's incredible. So um, one of the people I met with there that I'd like to read a portion of our conversation is a, a, a man named Vitek Jiranek. He's from the Czech Republic, and he had worked in eleven different wildlife research positions around the planet. And he was there working on his PhD in ornithology from Louisiana State University. And he, he is a student of Tom's. And so we were having a conversation about what he was studying. And he was just telling us all kinds of amazing things about what he was learning. Um, but then uh, the conversation took a somber tone when we started talking about his specific research. He said, quote, island biogeography is no longer an offshore enterprise. It has come to the mainland. It's everywhere. The problem of animal and plant populations left maroon within various fragments under circumstances that are untenable for the long term has begun showing up all over the land surface of the planet. The familiar questions recur. How many mountain gorillas inhabit the forested slopes of the Virunga volcanoes along the shared borders of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, and Rwanda? How many tigers live in the Sariska Tiger Reserve in northwestern India? How many are left? How long can they survive? Now there's anger in his voice. How many grizzly bears occupy the North Cascades ecosystem? a discrete patch of mountain forest along the northern border of the state of Washington. Not enough. How many European brown bears are there in Italy's Abruzzo National Park? Not enough. How many Florida panthers in Big Cypress Swamp? Not enough. How many Asiatic lions in the forest of Gur? Not enough. How many injury in the Alamazotra? Not enough. And so on. The world is broken into pieces now. Just before going into Camp 41 in Manaus, I met with another of Dr. Lovejoy's colleagues, a woman named Dr. Rita Mesquita, and that is her real name. Um, she's a biologist and researcher with the largest research institute in the Amazon. And uh, we went for a really great walk, and there's a little patch of the rainforest there in the middle of the city, and she would take people on tours. and point out plants and species and things and um, you know she I'd ask her about something and she's like oh, I really don't know that much about it but and then five minutes later you know she's still talking about it so very humble but extremely knowledgeable at the same time and um, we uh, we had a chat that ended up getting a bit personal that I'd like to um, read you um, a, a bit about uh, she said we're not telling the general public what is really going on end quote she had co-edited a book with Lovejoy and authored many peer-reviewed scientific papers and is a force to be reckoned with but she personally feels inadequate when looking at the bigger picture of the climate crisis it's clear to her that we are nowhere, nowhere near where we need to be. Quote, I have zero pride in all my papers because we're preaching to the converted, she said. What I want to do is talk to the outside world. I want to be able to just talk to people and tell them what is actually happening. We need to educate people about what is really going on with climate disruption. Like so many of the experts I'd spoken with for this book, she believes the root cause of climate disruption is humanity's lack of connection to the planet. Quote, even here in Manaus, kids don't understand that they live in the Amazon, she says. So there is no connection at all with anything, and that is the problem. There's sadness in her voice as she tells me this. 
I made a personal decision to not have kids because I don't have a future to offer them. I don't think we are going to win this battle. I think we are really done. Tropical rainforests globally are already so degraded that instead of absorbing emissions, they're now releasing more carbon annually than all of the traffic in the United States. Wow. Uh, and this is before what happened this summer. Uh, in 2010, there was a drought in the Amazon that released as much CO2 as the total annual emissions of Russia and China combined. Um, there's 1.5 acres of rainforest being lost every second. And at some point in the not so distant future, the Amazon will regularly emit more carbon than it absorbs. Yet another critical tipping point for Earth. Uh, I want to close this part of the talk in the Amazon with, uh, I had a long, I did several interviews with Dr. Lovejoy, but then I had one long um, one where he, he got a, a bit emotional, which was very unlike him. He's very, very quiet, humble, soft-spoken, very measured. Um, but I want to just read you about a page that uh, was, I, I think, very um, prescient. There are reasons other than moral concerns for protecting the Amazon, including our own self-interest. Quote, and this is him, we go to the doctor in the pharmacy and we have no clue where our drugs came from. More of that is from nature than we realize. Lovejoy mentions a poison found in the Amazon that led to the production of the pharmaceutical captopril, which in turn became one of the first ACE inhibitors and is now used by hundreds of millions of people to control their blood pressure and heart conditions. Captopril widens blood vessels, making it easier for the heart to pump, pump blood through them. Most of the people taking it have no idea that this drug responsible for their health is from the Amazon. He mentions another example, a vine found by indigenous people. When they threw it in a lake, all the fish came to the surface gasping for air, which made their fishing much easier. The name of the substance that causes this is curare. It is used today as a muscle relaxant during major abdominal surgeries. His point is that if we continue to destroy the Amazon at our current pace, we may never know how it could help save millions or possibly billions of human lives in the future. Lovejoy believes that this is one of the least appreciated aspects of biodiversity. Quote, the Amazon is a gigantic library of the life sciences which is continually acquiring new volumes, he says. We are discovering new species of birds all the time. And wrapped up in all that is incredible adaptation capacity. It's important to remember each species represents a set of solutions to a set of biological problems. And any one of those can turn out to revolutionize how we understand biological science, end quote. Lovejoy pauses and gazes admiringly at the jungle surrounding the camp. He took a few quiet moments and then he turned back to me. We are so stuck on ourselves, we don't think we need any of it, he says. We think we are some godlike thing. So now we move into my least favorite part of how I've been giving this lecture is giving a macro view of, of how far along we are. But I, I think it's important for context for um, how I'll conclude. 2018 was the fourth warmest year ever recorded. The only warmer years prior to that were 2015, 2016, and 2017. We're currently in the middle of what is on track to be the warmest decade since record keeping began. We're already in the sixth mass extinction event that industrial civilization caused. And we're injecting CO2 into the atmosphere at a rate 10 times faster than what occurred during the Permian mass extinction event 252 million years ago that annihilated 90% of life on Earth. Our current extinction rate is 1,000 times faster than a normal background extinction rate. And it's faster even than that of the Permian mass extinction. As Wanless shared earlier, the oceans absorb 93% of all the heat we've added to the atmosphere. To give you an idea of how much energy that is, if the oceans hadn't absorbed the heat, right now our global atmospheric temperatures would be 97 degrees Fahrenheit hotter. 
Today's CO2 levels in the atmosphere at around 415 ppm are already in accordance to another study of what historically brought about a steady state temperature around the globe ranging from 4 to 7 C higher than today. To give you an idea of how much warmer that is, everything that we're seeing and have seen happening on the planet because of the climate crisis is we've warmed it approximately 1.1 C so far. And we're talking about between, according to one study, four to seven C higher once the planet basically catches up with the amount of CO2 that's already been injected into the atmosphere. Insects, which are essential for proper functioning of all of Earth's ecosystems as, uh, are, and, as their food for other creatures, pollinators and recyclers of nutrients are in trouble. There's been a couple of big studies come out in the last year that showed we're losing, and not just, well, partially because of the climate crisis, but also because of habitat loss and uh, insecticides. Uh, and pollution, we're losing 2.4% uh, of global insect biomass annually. So assuming things don't speed up, that means that within uh, 100 years, there will be uh, probably no insects at the current trajectory. Since just 1970, 60% of all mammals, fish, uh, birds, and reptiles are gone. And another way to think about that is about the scope of that, since we so easily otherize the other species, um, what would we call it if there had been a 60% reduction of humans since 1970? Hmm. Several scientists I spoke with for this book believe we have a minimum of 3C warming baked into the system, just like that study I shared earlier, um, uh, but a little bit lower. Meaning if we stopped all CO2 emissions on a dime today and started doing as much mitigation as we could, uh, they see no way around at least 3C warming, which is absolutely catastrophic. I mean, 1.1 is already catastrophic. I would, I would argue that with anybody. Um, the IPCC's worst case temperature scenario is 4 to 5C warming by 2100. The IPCC has come under a lot of uh, scrutiny lately. It's clear it's a politicized uh, organ. Uh, it's not pure science. And I've even had a couple of different IPCC authors tell me off the record uh, that you could take their worst case scenarios and possibly double them of sea level rise, of temperature rise, et cetera. Um, there's been other studies come out also that show um, we, we could absolutely see five, six, seven, even as much as 10 C warming by 2100. And you know, those are various studies with various projections, but bottom line is uh, even if it's only three C warming, again, bearing in mind that we're at 1.1 right now and look at what's happening on the planet. It's clear that we are in a nonlinear situation of climate disruption impacts and their effects and feedback loops. Uh, it's clear to me that we're locked into a course for uncontrollable levels of climate disruption, bringing mass migrations, more destruction, starvation, disease, and war. And there can no longer be any question that this so-called civilization of Western industrialization and what it's doing to the planet is ending. So. It's this feeling right now is, is like what was upon me when it came time to write the conclusion of my book. And, you know, I had chapter after chapter of, you know, up in the Arctic with permafrost and subsea methane and glaciers and, and what's happening to indigenous populations. And, and it's, it's this feeling of, of doom and hopelessness that I was confronted with and frankly I had no idea how to end the book and um, I, I did come across a couple of things that helped me and then something else happened and I want to just share um, those first and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into what happened that basically changed how I decided to end the book. One was a quote that I came across by Czech dissident writer and statesman Václav Havel because I was confronted with 
what's the point in anything? You know, obviously I was a bit depressed and it was like, why do anything? You know, and, and having hope seems like um, uh, just unreal, just a sort of a denialism. And how can you have hope knowing these facts and knowing this data? And, and hope seemed like kind of a false sense of security. And so Howell's quote is, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. And so I had to start learning a new reason to do the work that I was doing in a new way of looking at what was happening. And it also meant processing through a whole lot of grief that I was confronted with working on this book, which is not a unique thing. There's been plenty of really great articles come out, even in just the last few months, talking about the grief that climate scientists are going through, the depression, the sadness, and everything. And uh, I came across another really great writer and speaker, uh, a man named Stephen Jenkinson. He's Canadian and had worked in the palliative care industry in Canada for 30 years. And, had helped sat at the bedside a thousand over a thousand people while they left this world and well attuned to the fact that as he sees it the dominant culture of the west uh, it has this denial of death and this this aversion to aging and basically won't do endings and so i wanted to quote uh, something he shared at a talk he gave about in part about the climate crisis at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. And he said, the question is not are we going to fail? The question is how? The question is what shall be the manner of our inability to care for what was entrusted to us? The question is our manner of failing. He went on to talk more about that. He said, grief requires us to know the time that we're in. The great enemy of grief is hope. Hope is a four-letter word for people who are willing to know things for what they are. Our time requires us to be hope-free, to burn through the false choice of being hopeful and hopeless. They are two sides of the same con job. Grief is required to proceed. So I was right in front of my deadline of the book, literally. <coughs> 10 days, and I met a man, um, a teacher of Cherokee descent, Stan Rushworth, and we uh, were at a, a conference together, a get together, and uh, it was basically a healing conference about healing, um, primarily about healing the earth. And uh, we had some really profound conversations. and. He started sharing me different stories, and then I knew right then, okay, this is the earth deciding. Um, I'm gonna need to, I'm gonna, these stories are how I'm gonna end this book. And so I, I'm confronted a lot with people, especially we go into the Q&A as is customary and talks like this, and, and a lot of people are like, well, what do we do? Tell me what to do, you know, and it's about action and doing. And I, I understand that. That's, a, I think, a, a healthy response in a crisis. Okay, let's get busy. What can we do? Um, and he talked to me primarily about being, the right way of being. And he talked, he uses the word uh, comport. How are we going to comport ourselves during this time? And uh, I first want to share something he shared with me about um, he teaches critical thinking in Native American literature at Cabrillo College in Aptos, California, just nearby Santa Cruz. And he consistently would bring indigenous elders into his classes to speak with them, especially about what is the right relationship to have with the planet. And so I want to read, I'll just share with you uh, this part. His students always ask the elders, quote, what can we do? Henry Tyler, an Arapaho elder, would point a finger to his head and say nothing for a while. He'd stand there for minutes, and then he would answer, use this, and smile. <coughs> Quote, everything he'd said for the previous three hours would provide tools for those who chose to respond, Stan told me. He gave so much to reflect upon that a finger to the head was a powerful statement. CeeLo Black Crow, a Lakota Sundance leader and elder, would smile and say, think about it, that's up to you. I can't tell you what to do. Educate yourself. 
then you decide. Of this, Rushworth added, like Uncle Henry, listening to him for three hours would give an incalculable amount of information and food for reflection. The common message these men offer, Rushworth believes, is that each person must come fully into their own agency and from that place decide upon their proper course of action. Otherwise, simply following the lead of someone else would entail a lack of the kind of conviction needed for these times. And then I want to conclude with a story that is extremely important to me personally. Um, I, I always, I was born in Texas, and for some weird reason, I always was gravitated towards the mountains. Uh, it didn't make a lot of sense. There's not a whole lot of mountains in Houston. Um, but I got out of college, and I moved to Colorado, and there were the Rockies, and that's why I went. Um, I moved up to Alaska in 96 just to climb. I had seen Denali, and it was love at first sight. And then now I live in Washington State. The Olympics are my backyard. Cascades are right across the water, and that's on purpose. Because every time I go up in there, that's for me when everything gets right. No matter what's going on, that's when everything makes sense to me, especially right now. And Stan shared this story with me, and uh, it makes sense. It made sense. Um, and so I want to share this story. I mean, it made sense that now I understood why I always go to the mountains. And it's an old story that was told by East Ott writer and storyteller Dr. Daryl Babe Wilson, who was born into uh, a tribe, rather than mispronouncing the tribe name, um, it's commonly referred to as the Pitt River Nation of Northeastern California. Wilson tells of Mis Misa, a small but powerful student that inhabits Akuyet, the mountain that the white man named Mount Shasta, which is a very high 14,000 foot volcano in uh, the southern end of the Cascade Range of North Central California. Mis Misa is a spirit force that balances the earth with the universe and the universe with the earth. Wilson says that Akuyet is, quote, the most necessary of all of the mountains upon earth for Mis Misa keeps the earth the proper distance from the sun and keeps everything in its proper place when wonder and power stir the universe with a giant yet invisible canoe paddle. Mis Misa keeps the earth from wandering away from the rest of the universe. It maintains the proper seasons and the proper atmosphere for life to flourish as earth changes seasons on its journey around the sun." End quote. The mountain, the story tells us, must be worshipped because Mis Misa dwells deep within it. To climb the mountain with a pure heart and with real resolve, and to communicate with, quote, all of the light and all of the darkness of the universe, is to place your spirit in a direct line from the songs of Mis Misa to the heart of the universe. While in this posture, the spirit of man slash woman is in perfect balance and harmony, end quote. For as long as Mis Misa's instructions are followed with sincerity, society will be sustained. Its inhabitants will survive for the long term. Quote, the most important of all the lessons, it is said, is to be so quiet in your being that you constantly hear the soft singing of Mis Misa. End quote. However, the story also warns that by not listening to Mis Misa's song, the song will fade. Mis Misa will depart. Quote, and the earth and all of the societies upon earth will be out of balance and life therein vulnerable to extinction. Clearly, that is what's happened. And we have stopped listening. There is this profound disconnection from the planet, and the reckoning is upon us. And I think the place to start before jumping into action and running around and trying to figure out what to do is to get really, really quiet inside and start practicing that listening. Because for me, and the thing I can just impart to you from my own experience is all of my best, I wouldn't say decisions, the most important messages I've got about what to do, about when I decided to go to a rock and start working as a journalist, when I've made, had big personal life decisions to make, and then when I got the message to do this book, it was always when I was up in the mountains. And it wasn't because I thought about it the right way or I figured something out, but 
it just came to me when I was up there. And so for me, to put it a little bit more poetically, that was what I would do to go listen to Mies Misa was my favorite place was to go into the mountains. And then that's when I was given my marching orders about here's what you really want to do. And it, you know, it, it came in here. And so the thing that I like to end these talks with is to give you two questions to uh, take home with you. And um, again, you know, I, my place to listen is the mountains, but listening can also be in meditation or in the trees or uh, in a lake or by a river or at the beach, etc. So the two questions are that I'll end with, where do you go to listen to Mies Misa? And when was the last time that you went there to listen? Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. So we have some time for Q&A or comments. The floor is yours. Yes, ma'am. You said um, in and throughout the large sections of the Amazon were releasing a lot of carbon. Can you explain that process? How, how does that happen? Right. I will. Susan probably is better suited to explain that than me, but I, I did research that, so I'll talk about it. Um, the question was, um, sorry about that, I'll not touch that. Um, um, during the, it, can I explain uh, why during a drought in the Amazon more CO2 was released in, I think it was in 2010, the drought, that that one drought, it, the rainforest released more CO2 than Russia and China combined, which is a stunning figure. Um, that's from a study. And what happens is a healthy forest or rainforest sequesters carbon. You know, we all know, you know, that the whole environmental thing of hug a tree and plant a tree, that's for a reason uh, that trees sequester carbon as they grow. And uh, when they dry out during a drought, not just the trees, but the soil, and of course all the vegetation starts to uh, release carbon instead of sequester it. And so they start to die, uh, the soil dries out. Soil by itself sequesters an enormous amount of carbon. So the droughts that have been besetting the Amazon, not even talking about the wildfires, that's a whole nother set of problems. But the droughts have been severe enough that even in the Amazon you see these huge CO2 releases. And so that's why another reason it's so important to protect the Amazon, aside from the obvious moral reasons, um, but for our own survival that it sequesters an enormous amount of co2 from the atmosphere and that's why these fires over this summer and i, I maybe i shouldn't even talk about them in past tense i mean it's probably still going on but um they it was an 85 percent increase in the area burned compared to the same period last summer and it's it, it's at a tipping point now where thomas lovejoy had released a paper that said once we lost 25% of the Amazon, that the whole system would basically collapse and shift mostly over into savanna, which means we would basically lose the Amazon and all that CO2 sequestering, not even talking about the biodiversity and the cascading effects of that. And we're at, thus far, the WWF released a report that said we're, uh, I think it was a year or so ago, that said we've lost 17%. And so how much did we just lose this summer? Um, so the point is, we're, if we're not already at it, we're getting very, very close to the threshold that Lovejoy warned, warned about. Yes, sir. Um, I read your book and found it very interesting. Uh, I'm wondering what role inequality, power, structure, uh, private interests play, because uh, you're dealing with a lot of empirical evidence and scientists and obviously very powerful ethnographic studies, of, but it's, uh, to me there's also uh, people who are suffering because of the action of others, there are people who are more responsible, there are people who are in positions of power who are deciding to act in ways that are really pernicious. So I was wondering where that plays in your analysis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did address that in a couple of different ways in the book. One, I remember one study off the top of my head, it's, there's just 70 companies no, it's 100 companies. The Guardian released this report, um, I think about a year, year and a half ago. Um, 
there's 100 companies responsible for 70% of the CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. Just 100 companies. So that, I think, really, you speak directly to that, where it's this very, very small percentage of the population that's profiting while while generating all of the waste and emissions, or the majority of it, and it's everyone else and all these other species that are paying the price. So one way I took to address that in the book was the, the chapter on, I went to St. Paul Island and the Pribilofs in the Bering Sea uh, to write specifically about how the Anungun, more commonly referred to as the Aleutian people, were impacted. Because indigenous populations around the globe, and this would include you know, poor people and usually people of color as well, they're the ones taking it on the chin, as always, the, the fastest and the hardest. And so there, you know, you look at southern Louisiana and there's already tribes being flooded out. Their cemeteries are already underwater where they've lived there for centuries. And they're the ones that are having to move. So there is this gross disparity between, you know, the, the capitalist system, the global capitalist system, and what's being done to, to continue that system financially and the biggest emitters, and this includes, of course, industrial agriculture. Someone usually brings that up in my talks, and that's a very important component of this and important of what's going on in the Amazon with why Bolsonaro is literally promoting the burning of a lot of these, these parts of the forest by farmers so they can put in pasture and bring in beef cattle to sell in the Europe and the, U Europe and the U.S. But it is, there is a gross, gross disparity between uh, those who are primarily responsible, the companies, and those who are really paying the price. And that's, that's a very, very important point. And, you know, and then what comes up is, well, all of us need to change our lifestyle. Absolutely. You know, I mean, for sure, we all have a moral obligation to work to reduce our carbon footprint, do offsets, do all of that. Um, but keeping our eye on the ball is... Um, what all of us in this whole room emit in total for our lifetime is a thimbleful compared to, say, Exxon or Chevron. I mean, there, there's the 100 companies. There's the list of people that need to be stopped. And obviously, at this point, public pressure isn't going to do it. It would have to be, I think, international gov government pressure or something like the UN because it brings up, and I'm, I'm going on a tangent here, but like you look at what happened in the Amazon. And the same, I think, can be said for this country now under this administration, where it's just not, there's no conservation. Let's just take all regulations off and just stomp on the gas. Let's frack everything. Let's drill. Let's just go for it. Bolsonaro, the tropical Trump in Brazil, same thing. Just burn the Amazon. Let's pay that. Let's put up dams. Let's mine. Let's farm everything. Um, so at what point in the climate crisis is that akin to like Hitler during World War II? When our very survival, not, not even to speak of all the species that are being lost, but when our very survival depends upon a functioning Amazon, there is no way we're gonna continue if the Amazon goes away. I just, it's hard to envision that not having massive global impact. So at what point is, is our global governments then, like the UN say, responsible for stepping in and stopping this because it's a it's a you know what he's doing is akin to a madman you know this thing's burning amidst this crisis we all know where it's going so when and how does he be when and when and how is he stopped sorry for the tangent yeah in the back yeah yeah i think that it's it's like a, um you hit the reference can be so so provocative about i'm just gonna say he's already that, that, that's already happening because of course in world war ii so many of us with, I mean, not me, but I wasn't born, but complexions, like, we did our bit, right, but we didn't, and we tightened our belts, but we didn't suffer what the targeted people did. And so your point about who's taking it right now on the chin, hard and relentlessly, like every blow comes before you can revert from the first one, are the people undergoing genocide. So I just want to really drive home that that's not future tense, that's happening. Yeah, that's thank you. Point. Thanks. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's, which is, it's, you know, the refugees uh, from Syria, you know, all the deaths lost in the Arab Spring. I mean, the Arab Spring, you know, the, the foundation of that is drought. 
and record drought and what's happening in Syria and it, you know, everywhere. It, it's absolutely true. And parts of Africa are already huge, huge refugee crises. And, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just getting warmed up. I mean, if you think about it, um, with the sea level rise that I mentioned, if we just have only 10 feet by 2100, that's pretty much every major coastal city on the planet gone. I mean, Indonesia is moving their capital, Jakarta. It's a multi-million person city uh, because of sea level rise. I mean, we're looking at literally more than a billion refugees by 2100 just from sea level rise alone. The study I cited was two billion. And the first of those are always the people with the least, you know, it's people, minority groups, people of color, people living uh, already right on the edge. Those are always the first to go. And that's, that is, as you said, it's already happening. And it's easy for those of us here that aren't living right on the coast or don't live in Paradise, California and haven't had all of our loved ones and belongings burnt to the ground and incinerated. Um, we still talk about it in the future tense. And I sometimes fall into that, you know, accidentally, but it is, it's present tense. You know, right now as we speak, there's people that are refugees and have been for years because of the climate crisis and, and there's no end in sight for them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the back. You mentioned like there's over a hundred companies that um, make up 70 percent of what's going on with regards to the climate, but they couldn't do that unless people like us bought their product the next advisor our rights on a local basis to say this can't exist. So is there anyone going about setting up a program where collectively as locals we can sit down and say we're going to fight what's going on? Absolutely. And and it's, you're looking at the smaller picture and working up. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, he brought back home, I'm just repeating it for the, the TV, that uh, I mentioned the 100 companies responsible for 70% of the CO2 emissions citing that Guardian report. Uh, but that doesn't happen if we're the collective we are not all buying their products and continuing this way of life And that's absolutely true. And that's where I think, you know, on a gr ground level grassroots basis groups like 350.org uh, Are have been engaged in that struggle of awareness and different actions along that front for a long long time And that's a that's a great place to start and and again um, I'm, I'm gonna kind of use that as a little bit of a segue that I, I, I share that Mises Misa story and I, I bring up that need to really listen and, and get in here what to do because I, you know, what I just shared with you, it's like this is apocalyptic information. I mean, the crisis is upon us. And so we're truly in an emergency and this calls for dramatic measures. And so I, I think personally, when I share that story, the, the intent really is um, what am I willing to put on the line? And, you know, like I did it when I went to Iraq. I was willing to die to go in there. I felt passionately enough at the time to go get that information out about what was being done to the Iraqi people <coughs> after 12 years of genocidal sanctions and then the war and invasion and occupation that I, something sparked and I went and I was willing to die to do that job. And I did it off and on for 10 years. And, and I think that now we're at a point where, you know, the climate crisis coupled with a fascistic authoritarian government, which is happening here now, um, you know, there's, I think each one of us is going to have some pretty hard decisions to make and be willing to take kind of up the risk level to a, a, a new level. And, and, you know, that might, that's going to mean different things for everybody. I mean, some people might just feel a deep urge to go study medicine. It's like, great, we need doctors. Or to go play music. Great, we need music more than ever. Um, and then others might do a lot more frontline stuff, you know, whatever that might look like. Whether it's, you know, going and protesting a pipeline and chaining yourself to something in a state where that's going to land you in federal prison. Or, or something even more than that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you kept uh, mentioning denialism, and I was sort of interested in knowing how you think about that, and I'll just add one comment. Um, in sort of trying to think about this myself, uh, the comment that, or uh, an insight that I've read about how 
complexity actually creates an environment in which the most simple answers have the most appeal for people who are uncomfortable with complexity. It seems to me that summarizes a huge amount of what we're facing in this world today, this uncomfortableness with complexity. So just wonder if you could comment on that and denialism. Um, I, well, I, I really can't add anything to the comment about complexity. I mean, I think that's true. You know, there's so much, we're over-informationalized, and, and the news is tra traumatic every day. I mean, just every day, open your browser and read what's going on in D.C. and what's happening climatologically. That alone, not even talking about all the other crises, is absolutely traumatizing, and I mean that literally. If you really read it and think about it, and think about refugees and have, you know, or know some, you know, or worked in places where you go talk to these folks and get to know them and see and not otherizing them anymore. But yeah, I know those people and are, you know, then it's traumatizing. And um, the, the denial, when I, I talk about that, I, as I mentioned earlier, it's, I kind of talk about it in that framework of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross model of the five stages of grief. So it goes denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And denial, you know, obviously there's the fossil fuel funded denial of the right. Um, and I was really, really angry at that for a long time. And I just wanted to, you know, grab those people by the neck, you know. But when you look at them then through the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross model, they're in the first stage of the five stages of grief. You're in denial. You have to be denying something to be in denial. And I believe that each one of us as animals, as the human animal, know, just like you, you, we have all watched like a deer when it knows, okay, there's something, maybe I'm in danger, I need to listen up. They, they can sense danger, and I believe all of us do that, even those in denial, and, and, and they're in denial for a reason, and they're just suffering, and they're scared because this is an overwhelming, complex, crisis on multiple fronts all at once and it, the outlook is extremely grim and then of course you know there's plenty of people who look around you know in the anger phase and then the bargaining phase oh well if I do this maybe it won't be so bad or you know or maybe maybe that study is too too extreme you know and then there's the depression phase which speaks for itself and then acceptance and also you know what I've learned about these five stages is they're not linear and you go you know weave in and out of them and go through them and you know i mean i just flew out here so i've got an active part of denial happening and we have to to live in the matrix to a certain extent um but but point being is i think it's important you know that's why i talk about grief and the importance of that is that it's if i'm really being emotionally honest and, and looking at this squarely on a daily basis i should probably be crying every day knowing what I know about species that are being lost and, 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 you know, having been places for this book that now are no longer there or glaciers for this book that now are no longer there in just a couple of years. So anyway, I'm, I'm digressing, but I hope I covered it soon. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Phil Herter. I'm a uh, local organizer for the Citizens Climate Lobby. And if you know about them, they have... Uh, one key uh, objective, which is to pass a bill that puts a fee on all carbon being extracted out of the ground and then provide a dividend to all US citizens each month so that you be able to get ready to climate change. I mean, that's gonna be, I feel, probably the most popular bill of all time. <laughs> because it, it rebalances the market and it takes from the bad guys and gives it to the rest who, well, basically we're all suffering uh, the consequences. Uh, I believe um, you could say climate change is sort of a, you know, it, it, it's a result of prosperity in a sense, but lack of scientific uh, monitoring and then, you know, projecting, you know, telling, delivering the information to everyone. So it seems to me that, um, you know, we need, our society needs to know that science is not political, but instead it's, 
it needs to be popular and in appearance, you know. Um, I, if I could just make two statements, one to this gentleman and the other to the fine lady here. Um, this is on, regarding the, the confusion, sort of, of all these uh, consumer habits that we have and how we know what to do. Um, what if we could just have a carbon number on any product or material so that, you know, in human actions, we could have a carbon number on it so that you can help evaluate how bad it is and, you know, and how it's accumulating uh, based on the distance that object was that had to travel to you and, or whatever it is. Um, and in, in terms of, um, you know, the point that complexity makes people go towards simplicity. Um, if I could just offer the point that, uh, you know, I don't think it's high technology that brought us all the pollution. I think it's, you know, just consumer habits. <laughs> but I think that, that the solution for uh, reversing climate change is going to be technological. We got all the satellites, we got the imagery. Um, and I, I really, I think that um, the whole market can be rebalanced by having, like on Google Earth, a display of all the consequences and how people can engage to solve it, actually to gamify it. I guess what I, I'm actually trying to do is offer a little hope that there are solutions that everybody can participate in. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> well, I think I shared, shared my thoughts about hope. Um, I, uh, <laughs> okay, I got one last one. And do you have thoughts on uh, the Exxon court case? Because frankly, if we do it right, it, it, we can nail them. Um, I think if we take a very sober look at how the world works, real politic, who has all the power and where things are going. Um, I mean, in this country, for example, uh, uh, corporate power, right-wing fascist corporate power has a lock on the White House, the Supreme Court, more than 200 federal courts, and the Senate. And none of that's gonna change in the next so-called election. That's my prediction. And I feel very confident about that. And so, uh, Power never relinquishes power willingly. And, uh, you know, that's what we're up against. And we have to face that. I personally feel like I have to face that fact politically. And so if that's the operating word, if that's the, 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 the landscape that I'm operating in, then that's going to change how I'm, I'm going to operate. You know, it's basically a war zone landscape. And I need to start behaving accordingly. Because they've been behaving that way for a long time. And so uh, in that political landscape, do I think, um, am I gonna wait for a Supreme Court to reverse a decision or make some kind of a decision about uh, uh, Exxon or something else? Like, probably not, you know? And so I'm talking about radicalizing thinking, radicalizing actions, and I'm not, I'm not advocating violence, but I'm talking about getting very outside of the box. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, as far as the climate, you know, I think I just outlined how far along we are. I mean, like what Juan Liss says, the short version of the story is you can't take the heat out of the oceans. That means Western Antarctic ice sheet and a certain amount of warming is inevitable. And we're looking at, you know, minimum tens of feet. You know, several different studies show we're looking at somewhere between we have a CO2 content in the atmosphere right now. We're locked in to somewhere between 10 and upwards of 35 meters of sea level rise. And so we have to accept that fact that we're going to live on a, and, a, and children being born today are going to live on a dramatically different planet than what we have right now. And, um, you know, I. I just finished the epilogue for this book because it's going to come out in paperback in March. And I had, took one section where I just said, well, I'll just do a little overview. It's only been nine months since the book came out, and I'll just do a little overview of what's happened in the last nine months. And it reads about like that part in the end of my talk where you want to like shoot yourself in the head after you hear it. You know, it's just like in nine months, this is what's happened. You know, look at what happened in Greenland last summer, the Arctic, the permafrost, 
methane that just came out two and a half weeks ago. Uh, the Amazon, I mean, go down the list. It's a litany of, you know, destruction. And so I think we just have to get really mature and sober about this is the environment that we're in now. This is what's happening politically, not just in this country, but this fascism that's spreading around the planet and, and get really, really real about, okay, if that's what's going down on the planet, what, what do I feel most called to do at this particular moment in history? And then, you know, one thing that Jenkinson talks about that I really love is uh, 20 years from now, if I'm still alive and, and there's a young kid that comes up to me and asks me two questions, did you know what was happening? As Jenkinson says, you know, you better hope you can say no, that you somehow didn't know. Because then the second question is, what did you do? And I think that's a good thing to think about. What did you do? What are you going to answer to that kid in 20 years? What did you do? Even when you knew it wasn't enough, did you stop? What did you do? I think that's where we are right now in history. Yeah, yes, sir. I, I think, you know, uh, silver lining, you look at the younger people, you know, people, you know, half a million people showing up to see Bradley Thornburg in Montreal. You know, it's pretty clear that there is a wave of uh, a demographic way of people much more in favor of environmental issues, you know, environmentalism. And you know, the question that I, I'm talking about is, you know, you have two, the two big forces out there right now. I, I see down the line you have environmentalism and capitalism. Mm -hmm. And you know, can, can they both coexist? And also, alternatively, can they exist without each other? Because of all these things that we have to do, you know, the economic, the, all the, 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 everything that we need to do to do this, these adaptations, really require more than just a government program here or there. You need like the whole capitalist energy to achieve so much change. And right now, of course, you know, we talk about, you know, talk about well, we're living in the social media. We've got these separate realities we're living in. The young people, I think, are not buying into what the older people have been brainwashed, you know. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The oil, and remember the Russians are oil producers, so they're doing a pretty good job of brainwashing the electric, too. But I don't think the young people are buying into that. So just a matter of time, you know, we get them to vote, you know, the 18 to 28-year-olds. That would be... Uh, a true yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's it's absolutely inspiring and humbling to watch, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old kids doing what they're doing. It's absolutely amazing. And I have a 16 year old nephew that uh, came up to stay with me for five days this past summer. And this is a kid that he's from Austin, Texas, and his parents are really conservative and he doesn't read the news. and. But he already knew everything. And that was a thing. It's like he didn't, he just knew, like, we are in it deep, you know? And he had this tremendous anxiety. And that's why he came up to stay with me. And so I took him out in the mountains for four days. And we just talked nonstop. And he wanted to know all the gory details from the book, you know? And he took it all, you know? And what I learned from that was just be honest and say, yeah, here's what's going on. And it's, it sucks. It's awful. And it's terrifying. And I'm scared, you know, and here's what I'm doing, you know, and we're going to go through this together, you know, and it's not all on you to change it or any of that stuff. But just I think the first step is and this is coming up more and more now is how do you talk to younger kids and, and all of that. And, you know, my first lesson is just be be very frank and very honest, because I already know anyway, you know, it's, it's his parents that are in denial. You know, but his generation gets it 100% because he's born straight into it, and there's no question. I think we just got to... We have, speaking of young people, we have a couple of students. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go. <laughs> you first. I'll be there tomorrow, too. Oh, um, so this is kind of in a different vein, but I know, especially in the Kribloffs, where the majority of the population are Native people who still kind of have subsistence living, and then, like, the other part of the population is really scientists. I was wondering if you could kind of speak about kind of the relation of their different perspectives on climate change and how you really saw that being in that kind of environment that's so different from 
really anywhere else? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, St. Paul was, I, I went there on purpose because um, it's way out in the middle of the Bering Sea. And if I remember right, there were like 234 year round residents, like that was it. And um, just heavy, heavy subsistence culture. And the thing um, with uh, indigenous folks is subsistence lifestyle and spirituality and culture and language you don't separate any of that stuff out. It's all one thing. And so the fact that they've been there for generations and relied heavily on fur seals and certain fish and certain birds, and that all those populations were declining dramatically, um, that's what everyone's talking about. And yeah, they're aware of the climate crisis, but they're just saying what they're saying. You know, and then there's scientists out there, and I, I ran in, I, I included one part of this in the book. I ran into some fish and wildlife guys that were out there doing um, studies on some of the different seabirds, and we're finding, yeah, hey, they're starving, so they're not having kids, or they're not having as many kids, or they're having one and then leaving them because they can't find food. So there's the scientific evidence, and then you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, the indigenous folks, this is just anecdotal evidence. But I was on a panel last week with Greg Castro mm -hmm. and uh, an indigenous man from um, California. And he says, you know, there's only you know, science. We don't need science to tell us all this. We're the ones that have been here for thousands and thousands of years. And he's like, you want to measure the temperature of a water and tell if it's getting warmer or not? Do that. You know, this is a really sensitive thing. And when you've been there for generations and you know what happens where and what time of year for millennia, one little tweak, you're going to notice. And so in a way, it's this it's not a difference, but I, it's really more of a synthesis of, you know, the science is just telling us what indigenous folks have seen, you know, for millennia. I mean, in another place I went was. Uh, Utkiagvik, uh, town formerly, it was recently re renamed, it's, it was called Barrow. And I interviewed Wesley Aiken, the, the village elder. He was 91 years old when I interviewed him. And I want to just read a quote of his. And again, this is where we have all this reams of scientific data now that I've just quoted from a lot of it, but, and there's so much out there. And then here's Here's what he says, you know, he's talking about the, the dramatic loss of the sea ice and the thawing of the permafrost up there. And he says, I'll just read this paragraph, the weight of his years underscores all of what the scientists have told me. It's all changing, he says. Some people from the lower 48 and the rest of the world are worrying about us, but I don't know why, because we are not worried. We know this is happening. People before me were telling us this was going to happen. They knew. I don't know how they knew, but they knew. I listened to them. Then it started to happen. And now I just know it's happening, and I don't think it's going to stop. So again, you know, it's, it's a great synthesis, and it's where science is essentially just confirming what indigenous people have known. And a lot of these stories um, of, like, the Mises Misa story, for example, um, science will back that up, you know, when, when you stop really taking care of the planet that you depend on for your life and your food and your water uh, and get disconnected from it and stop, and stop taking care of it over time, this story is going to end one way. And one thing that Stan and Greg both had talked to me about is, look, a lot of the indigenous stories have really bad endings because when you make bad decisions, there are consequences. So they don't all have happy endings. You had a question. Yes. Um, so I really appreciate the beginning of the speak. You gave this kind of metaphor situation of being on top of the mountain with a giant storm coming towards you. And as a leader in the room, what do you do? Do you tell people about what's coming to them and risk the panic, but know that you're in it together? Or do you hide it from them? And, um, and I don't know what else you do. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> we know we have to be telling people about what's coming and you've been around the world talking to people who have been seeing and learning and gathering information about what is coming and I'm wondering if you've seen any strategies for how to get that information across because 
I know that I myself have definitely had the feelings of panic and despair and the why bother doing anything if, um, if it's all coming down so soon and we know that that's not the approach we need to take. We need to take one of knowing what's going on, what the consequences of action are and with motivation and hope to do something about it. And so across the world, what kind of tactics and strategies? Have you seen any that have worked or not? And well, I, I think, um, I mean, that's a, a great question. And, and I think that for me personally, um, I just talk to people that want to know. You know, I mean, I start there. Um, you know, it's, it's information for people who want to know it, not people that need to know it. And yeah, we all need it. We, everyone on the planet needs it, but only a certain number of people really want it. And so I don't waste, you know, there's, I have finite time and energy just like everybody. And so I, I don't try to talk to people that doesn't want to know. I mean, I'm from Texas. There's this great saying that says, don't try to teach a pig to sing. It's gonna, you're going to look dumb and it's going to annoy the pig. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's true. It's, and, and so... Um, so don't try to teach the pig to sing. Um, and then, um, but I think, you know, think, like awareness raising, like Extinction Rebellion has done a great job. Greta Thunberg. I mean, look at the explosion of awareness in the last one year alone. I mean, we're even one of the, one of the democratic debates uh, that CNN hosted, like there's climate crisis, like literally, the, the, you know, right there, the headline, you know, like on the stage, I think it was that wouldn't have happened a year ago. And that, that was forced by the student strikes, the global student strikes, by Extinction Rebellion, by Greta Thunberg. I mean, this is a young person who is a warrior. I mean, she is a, a, a leader and an icon now for an entire generation. And, and uh, I think that's really, really inspiring. And I think that when people really want to know, I mean, I think it is, I mean, I don't... Uh, I don't know, it's tough. Like, I literally feel like I just know personally a handful of people in my own personal life that really, really get on a deep level. Like, this, we're, we're in it. We're in it, and it's intense. And then going out from there, I just, I just make it a point to use the right language. You know, it's not climate change or global warming. It's a climate crisis. It's an emergency. It's, it's a climate catastrophe. And... And uh, just talk about what the science is showing us as well as, you know, here's what indigenous people have been warning about for hundreds of years, right when they saw how rapacious the white man was. And I, I think on that note, um, it's, it's, it's past my time here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw it to a conclusion. But one thing I want to, that kind of touches on it. So um, I, I, I have a relative... I have more than one relative that's full on climate crisis denier. And, and then I look at that and I, I never could understand like how, how can you do that? You have kids, yeah. you know? And then now you look at these fossil fuel lobbyists acting as politicians in DC and you know, you know, envision white pasty guy stuffed in an expensive suit in your mind, you know, there you have it. Like, but even these people like, they have kids, they have grandkids. How can they be making these decisions, like willingly doing things that are killing the planet? And then I came across uh, um, a guy named Jack Forbes, who's a professor of uh, uh, Native American studies at University of California, Davis. And he wrote a book called Columbus and Other Cannibals of what he calls the sickness of exploitation or the Waitiko disease. Waitiko is his word for, the, the, his uh, people's word for cannibal, the Waitiko disease. And cannibalism, as Forbes defines it, is, quote, the consuming of another's life for one's own private purpose or profit. Forbes notes, quote, imperialism and exploitation are forms of cannibalism and in fact are precisely those forms of cannibalism which are most diabolical or evil. Quote, few if any societies on the face of the earth have ever been as avaricious, cruel, violent, and aggressive as have certain European populations, Forbes concludes. So it's Waitiko disease. And, and to me, that's capitalism. You know, it's global capitalism. These people have way, some degree of Waitiko disease, and it's catching, and indigenous people can catch it. And you, you can see these people, right? It's just business. 
right? That's classic. It's just business. You know, in the South, another thing that people do is, you know, you can say, oh, bless her little heart, and then say whatever you want, right? I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Oh, bless her little heart. She just sleeps with the whole football team. You know, it's like license to do what it's like. It's like that with Waitiko. It's, oh, it's just business. That means I can do whatever the F I want to do, right? I'm going to screw you over, screw over your family, take your house, eminent domain. It's just business. And that is insane. Capitalism is insane. It's rapacious. And it's literally killing the planet. And, and, yeah. and, and that time of reckoning, reckoning now is upon all of us, even, even the perpetrators. And you know, the question is, you know, so I'll, I guess I'll conclude with is, you know, I've just had to kind of relearn that thing that I was told a long time ago, work with your friends, don't fight your enemies. There's tons of work to do. Listen real closely inside. You're gonna know what you feel really, really called to do when you get really, really clear about the facts before us. And uh, there's people here that were introduced before me that are already engaged in really great work, this fellow and 350.org and, and uh, you know, and then as I'll, I'll plagiarize Greta Turnberg, well, I'll attribute it so I don't plagiarize her, where she says, you know, uh, action is the antidote to despair. And it's very, these are, these are super intense times. I still struggle with depression on a, regular basis and the antidote to despair is get off my ass and what am I going to do next? How am I going to serve the planet today? Mm -hmm. Get up each day and ask that. How can I best serve the planet today? And of course that includes serving other people. So thanks everybody for coming. So I wanted to mention that um, if anyone wants to go to Tizane after this, I'm hosting um, non-alcoholic drinks, but they do also have alcoholic drinks and food. Um, so we have a little spot if you go in and go to the right if people wanted to hang out because one of the things we need to do is figure out how to work together in communities as we kind of face what's going to happen. So anyway, thank you very much for coming. and. Um, I don't know, I have a, we have sign up things, I think with 350, or I have a group, um, Keep the Woods, which I'm very focused on protecting the natural world, because even if we solve the carbon problem, if we destroy the natural world, it's over. So, I mean, to me, that's job number one. So anyway, thank you. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs>